When we first meet Edmund at the beginning of scene two, why is he so angry? That's a really good question, but to answer it, we need to return to the scene before. In it, Edmund is forced to be silent as his father jokes about how shameful it is to have a bastard as a son. He refers to him as a horse son. He even jokes that having sex with his mother was good sport. The dude was humiliated, and it's safe to assume he's been humiliated like this all his life. But to make things even worse, Edmund has an older brother, Edgar, the legitimate son. And unlike Edmund, he's treated with dignity. And unlike Edmund, he will receive his father's inheritance. So in a way, his anger is kind of justified, right? Oh yeah, totally justified. He's been punished his entire life for a sin his father committed. But let's turn to Edmund's opening speech in Act 1, Scene 2. In it, he declares, Thou nature art my goddess, to thy law my services are bound. Why does he choose nature as his goddess? Well, for two reasons. First, it was natural forces, in this case, genuine sexual passion, that produced him in the first place. Secondly, society and culture, nature's opposite, have kind of ruined his life. It's a society that says a bastard is a lesser person. Well, there's no such rule in science or in nature, hence what Edmund calls the plague of custom. But Edmund doesn't just hate society, he also questions its very logic. He asks the audience, Why bastard, when my dimensions are as well compact, my mind is generous, and my shape as true as honest madam's issue? Why do they brand me as a bastard when my body is as strong and my mind is as sharp as any other man? So he's saying that bastards are just as good as anyone else. Exactly. But he goes even further, arguing that in many ways, they're better. He says, Why brand they us with base? who, in the lusty stealth of nature, take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed. Go to the creating a whole tribe of fops. So what he's saying is, why call us improper? We bastards are created with the powerful lust of nature. And those guys, they're created in the dull, stale, tired bed of conventional marriage. So from good sex comes good people. Exactly. Let's move next to Gloucester's big speech, starting on line 112. In it, he blames the sun, moon, and stars for all that's wrong in his life, and in the kingdom. These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. Love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide. In cities, mutinies. In countries, discord. In palaces, treason. And the bond cracked twixt son and father. He's blaming fate for all the world's problems. Right, fate in the form of astrology. That's a belief that the movements of the sun, moon, and stars determine the outcome of our lives. And I'm guessing Edmund doesn't really buy this. Oh, definitely not. In fact, when his father leaves, he delivers a speech in which he rants against the foolishness of such an idea. This is the excellent foppery of the world, that when we are sick in fortune, often the suffice of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disaster the sun, the moon, and stars. So this is the world's great foolishness, that when bad things happen to us, often because we cause them, we blame the sun, the moon, and the stars, instead of taking personal responsibility. But how relevant is that today? I mean, it's not like astrology is a major religion anymore. No, you're right, but think about how often we blame fate instead of taking responsibility for ourselves. You fail a test and you say, ah, oh, it wasn't my fault, it was my ADHD, or I'm not good at math, it's in my genes, I can't even help it. Or maybe you blame your circumstances on God or bad luck. And why do you do it? Because it's easier than admitting we're at fault. It's what Edmund calls an admirable evasion of whole master man. We the whoremasters, avoid taking responsibility by blaming fate. Then are Gloucester and Edgar to blame for being duped by Edmund? Yes and no. Of course, Edmund is the one committing the evil act here. But as he notes, both his brother Edgar and his father Gloucester are almost hopelessly naive. In Edmund's final speech of the scene, he says, A credulous father and a brother noble, whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none, on whose foolish honesty my practices ride easy. In other words, if his father and brother weren't so blind, Edmund's practices, his evil plot, 
couldn't come together so easily. So Edmund's evil and Gloucester and Edgar's blindness to deception create the perfect storm. Likewise, King Lear is also partially responsible for failing to recognize his daughter's deceptions. So to be moral, we must first see clearly. 